All attendees are in listen-only mode.
Good evening and welcome to the British Dyslexia Association's webinar broadcast, Realising Potential Through Enabling Technologies, with our guest tonight, Abby James. You will have seen from our opening slides, we have lots to offer here at the BDA, from training, conferences, assessment and much, much more. So please do visit our website for further information. On to tonight's session then. It's a great pleasure to have Abby James with us, especially this week during Dyslexia Awareness Week with the theme of 21st Century Dyslexia. We can't think of anyone more qualified really to talk about realising potential through assistive technology. Abby is a researcher and consultant on how technology aids learners with dyslexia. She's also chair of the BDA's New Technologies Committee and her research work with the ECS Accessibility Team at the University of Southampton explores improving the effectiveness of assistive technology. So it's brilliant to have you with us and I'm hoping that we can hand over now for tonight's session. Good evening, Abby. Hello, Donna. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to speak to you all tonight um, on this cold, dark October evening. Um, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I think that covered off a lot about what I do. But I also wanted to just say um, the work I'll be talking about tonight is particularly with my colleagues in Southampton. And hopefully on the screen now you can see the beginning of my slides and I just wanted to point out the URL that's on the screen because um, if you go there you can download the slides um, that I'll be talking through today and the materials if you want to take them away and look at them again in the future. So um, as Donna mentioned I'm currently a researcher with the University of Southampton and I also do a lot of training with schools and organisations around assistive technologies, accessibility and using technologies to remove barriers for people with dyslexia and other disabilities. And what I'm going to do today is talk through sort of some of the background of what we see and hear about how people are using these technologies, um, factors that affect their impact and their effectiveness and new technologies that are coming along in the horizon. Um, but first of all, I'd like to ask my colleagues to run a poll that we've set up because we'd like to ask you um, a, a question, one single question, and there's five possible responses about generally your tech savviness. How tech savvy are you? And uh, that will give me an idea of the audience I have, but also it will help me uh, with my talk as I'm going through because there's a particular point I want to talk about in terms of tech confidence. So hopefully that is now available to you. Okay. okay, thank you very much. I'm going to come back to the results from that uh, when we are later on in the, uh, in the talk as we're going through. So to start what I'm going to talk about. First of all, let's talk about the role of technology in our lives now. And um, technology is embedded in our homes, in our workplace and in education. And this is a, an image I like to show of actually sort of what our learning environment is now becoming. This is a, an image from a collaborative teaching space in a college where every student is uh, working from a computer, a teacher is using a touch interface and there are multiple screens on the wall displaying different information. There's a visualizer over on the left hand side where paper based resources or physical resources can also be then digitized and projected onto the screens. And this is really environment we're now moving to where technology is part of our day-to-day -to -day life. When I started off in the assistive technology field 17 years ago, technology was still something we were starting to get familiar with. People were starting to learn, the internet was just starting to take off and um, we really were not having the sort of craze of a technology throughout our lives. So that's had a great influence on assistive technology and how it's used. But first of all, I'm going to step back and actually look at what is the impact of having all this technology 
in our lives and particularly when we're talking about uh, dyslexia and specific learning difficulties does technology have a positive impact on learning well, the Sutton Trust and Education Endowment Fund Toolkit, which did a review of all the research, summarised the impact of technology by saying that studies consistently find that digital technology is associated with moderate learning gains. Technology should support pupils to work harder, for longer or more efficiently to improve their learning. So there's a few caveats in there. They're saying moderate learning gains. And actually that's partly to do with it's quite difficult for us to assess the impact of technology on its own because it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And children like to use technology. It can be motivating when they use it. But this sort of consistent feeling of technology has some impact was even recognised in 2002 when the government organisation at the time, Vector, that looked after technology in education, they found that ICT, as they called it, technology tends to get better results because of its impacts on the learning environment, because of the students' motivation to learn in that using technology improved their motivation, and also because of the removal of inauthentic labour. For those of us that can remember before we had word processing and copy and paste, we were tipexing and rewriting out drafts of paper. So actually what technology has done as it's removed those uh, inauthentic skills, those skills that really are just part of the production to allow people to concentrate on creativity and actually developing the skills they need as part of education. But that's all talking about mainstream education. What about dyslexic pupils and learners? Well, even 30 years ago, we were recognising that computers could help dyslexic learners. And there's a quote on the screen uh, from a study um, by Elkin et al. back in 93, um, which was about computer readers. We would now refer to that as text to speech. That's when the computer reads aloud text. And that found that there were important compensatory aids that could enable many people with dyslexia to perform more effectively in reading related tasks associated with school and work. So there was recognition even then that assistive technology and specialist technologies could help. And I have to say that actually that was my experience in the 90s as well, because the image on the screen is of a laptop of uh, the same model that I had in the 90s. And I was lucky enough to have one in school. I always say laptop with a slight uh, ironic feel because it was seven kilograms and incredibly heavy to carry around school. But I have to say that that technology, even though it was very basic word processing at the time, was enough to help me get through education, to get through my GCSEs, my A-levels, onto a degree, and eventually a PhD as well. So I know, even at that basic stage, the potential impact that it can have on people's learning to remove barriers from dyslexia. And technology can actually have lifelong benefits as well. And that's because it can improve motivation, it can allow people to be more independent. It can allow them to improve their skills and output because they're not relying on other people assisting them to help overcome their difficulties. And that means they're more likely to succeed throughout education and into the workplace. Now, how much are people using technology, particularly specialist technology? Well, we had a study actually released last week sorry, last month by JISC in the UK, who looked at the use of digital technology in further and higher education, so post-16 students. And they asked students if they used assistive technology or technology that's specifically designed for people with disability or dyslexia or other productivity tools, such as recording their notes on their phone or taking photographs during uh, classes to help them with note taking. And they actually found that 20% of students were now making use of assistive technology in some form to help with their learning. So at least at post-16 education, there seems to be real quite an uptake of this type of technology now and a recognition that it can help with a variety of skills. Now, I keep throwing in this term assistive technology and it's quite a specialist term. And whenever I'm talking about technology, I like to really unpick what we mean by assistive technology. But you might remember that the title of this talk is about enabling technology, because that's another phrase we like to use. So what do we mean by assistive technology? Well, according to the British Assistive Technology Association, 
and this is using an international definition, assistive technology is any item or piece of equipment or product or system, whether acquired commercially or off the shelf, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain and improve the functionality and capabilities of individuals with disabilities. And with disabilities includes people with specific learning difficulties. And what is important to note with that definition is that we're not saying it's specialist or customised, it's more about how the technology is being, is being used to improve the functionalities and capabilities of individuals. So it doesn't have to be specialist technology to be assistive, it's how it's used. And we now want to talk about enabling technologies. And enabling technologies is a wonderful phrase because it's very motivating and officially enabling technology Technology is technology that provides the means to generate giant leaps in performance and capabilities of the user. So it's about that enabling impact that assistive technology can have. So what do we mean? What is assistive or enabling technologies? Where is it? Where can we find it? Well, some of it can be mainstream consumer technologies such as laptops, desktops and netbooks or notebooks, um, and such as the laptop I had nearly 30 years ago. It can be mobile phones and it can be tablets like iPads and other devices that we carry in our pocket and in our bags. It can also be educational and productivity technology. It can be ebooks such as on a Kindle device or read on, um, on a phone. It could be curriculum based apps to help with spelling or maths. It can be office applications like word processors, presentation tools, spreadsheets. It can also be calendars and reminders that are now ubiquitous again within all our phones and devices. Or it can also be that specialist assistive technology that allows you to give alternative access to a computer if you find it difficult to use the standard keyboard or mouse. It could be speech recognition which is involves talking to a computer or a tablet or phone and getting the text generated on screen. Or it can be that text to speech I mentioned earlier when we're talking, the computer is talking to us to read the contents of the text for us. But while there is this wide range of technology available, we should always remember that technology solutions, whatever is provided, must lessen difficulties and provide equal access. And there's a wonderful uh, quote I like to use from uh, Ginny Stacey, who's worked for many years at Oxford Brooks, U Brooks University supporting dyslexic students. And she always notes that a mismatch can hamper the student's ability to, to use coping strategies to manage their dyslexia. So we must be aware that sometimes giving technology to people with dyslexia can actually do more harm than good. And that's because not all software or hardware will help all dyslexic users. Those of you that work frequently with people with dyslexia will know that everybody has different difficulties and different strengths and skills. And even some software or hardware will frustrate dyslexic users particularly things like speech recognition, which takes a lot of time to train the computer and you have to be very structured in how you use the technology it can be incredibly frustrating. However, my big caveat with this is I could replace dyslexia on this slide and say that this impacts any user. In fact, we always have to be careful when using technology, whether it's within learning or within the workplace or at home. I'm sure many of you can think of scenarios when you've bought an app on your phone or had a piece of software installed at work and found that it doesn't do what it's meant to and can be frustrating. So there's always a risk that people feel that assistive technology is going to solve individuals' problems to do with dyslexia and then get incredibly frustrated when it doesn't. Actually, we need to remember that this is the problem with the technology, not necessarily the user. But we also need to make sure that technology is dyslexia friendly. And when we look at that, we often look at the design of technology and 
how it's been framed. And this is particularly important with software or tools that are being used for uh, in the curriculum or for teaching tasks. And my colleague at Southampton, along with a PhD student, Fadwa, um, who was from Saudi Arabia, looking in particular particularly at dyslexia friendly technology there and how they can develop it, did an extensive literature review and interviews with experts to identify a set of guidelines that we should use when looking at technology to decide if it's dyslexic, dyslexic friendly. And she concluded that dyslexia friendly technologies should consist of short, simple tasks that reinforce learning. I'm sure we've all come across activities where uh, children and adults in a game and that could be not just in a learning situation get to a point where they can't move forward and that's incredibly frustrating and we want technology to support a learning or working environment we should also support diversity and preferences some people will want to change the fonts or want to change the colors they may want the sound on they may not want any background music and we should always allow people to personalize their learning and working experience Technology should have structured and realistic tasks. One of the pieces of work I first did when I entered the assistive technology field was looking at typing tools and uh, identifying ones that were maybe more uh, suitable for people with dyslexia. And often with typing tools, you sit there and type gobbledygook for hours and hours and hours. That's not a realistic task and it's not reinforcing learning when we want to actually reinforce normal letter patterns when typing. So realistic tasks is always important. Particularly for people with dyslexia and reading difficulties, simple language and readable fonts is important. Often designers can be very artistic and creative, but actually their interface then becomes very cluttered and difficult to read. So we have to consider how the interface comes across as well. As we all know, multi-sensory learning can be particularly helpful with people with dyslexia. So combining audio and visual is great. And that's one of the particular advantages of using technology. You're automatically into a multimedia experience where you're interacting with a mouse and a keyboard in a kinesthetic way. You're seeing images on the screen and potentially hearing them. And sufficient and adaptable timing as well. Nothing can be more frustrating if you just aren't given the time to demonstrate your skills and abilities. So those are important dyslexia friendly guidelines for technology. And if you're often in the situation of thinking, well, what app or tool should I look at? Refer back to these, because particularly now with smartphone and tablet apps, there are so many available. It's very difficult for us to go through and look at all of these. But these simple guidelines can help. So I'm going to move on and try and focus a bit less on the technology and actually now talk about technology acceptance, because that's critical. We can all have this technology, but we have to use it. And this is a wonderful phrase and cartoon. It's not what the software does. It's what the user does. And acceptance is about somebody taking a new, a new app or a new piece of software and making sure they use it. And you'd be surprised that that doesn't always happen or maybe not. And why are we worried about acceptance? Well, there are studies that have shown that 25 to 75 percent of assistive technology is abandoned. That is, it's not accepted. And people who abandon technology are then less likely to try it again in the future. Think back to if you've come across frustrating technology. Have you ever gone and tried it again six months later and seen if it's working better for you? And another critical factor for us in this area when we are stretch for resources and often relying on special funding, decision makers are less likely to commit to resources in the future if they are seen not to be used. And there we have a picture of a probably a familiar site for many of you when you go into IT rooms and cupboards of shelves packed with boxes and CDs and microphones and wires. Every school, every organisation has one and unfortunately a lot of technology does get abandoned. But this is not specific to dyslexia. So I'm now going to ask my colleagues if they can pass me the results of the poll that we did, um, hopefully. Hi, Abby, would you like me to read them out for you? Yes, please. No problem. So we've got 5% of our listeners who class 
announce themselves as number five. I'm a tech geek. Yeah. We've got 46% of our listeners who class themselves as number four. They enjoy tech. We've got 45%, so it's very close, of our listeners who class themselves as number three. I would like to know more, but I'm not very confident. We've got 4% of people who class themselves as number two and 0% for number one. So nobody hates technology on this webinar. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Donna. Now that is actually perfect results. I didn't expect anybody to hate technology to attend a session like this on a Tuesday evening. Um, but what is interesting about that is it nearly fits what we call a normal distribution, a nice bell curve, where we have sort of probably a skewed a bit to the left compared to the graphs that I'm showing on the screen. But actually, when we talk about how, pe how interested are people in technology, we know it follows a normal distribution. And we know that there are those people who are geeks, and I'm married to one, who are innovators, who will take every new piece of technology and love it. And there are some who never like technology and never want to use it. And actually, this graph here is Roger's diffusion of innovation, and it's been proven to work in many technology fields, including social media and current technology developments. But it was originally come up with looking at how farmers we're adopting to new machinery and methods. So this is something that is completely independent of assistive technology. And if we look at current uh, technology trends, I can say that, you know, pretty much everybody has adopted the newspaper. I don't think there are many people in the world who don't have newspapers. If anything, they may be going out of style. And the, similarly, a radio, radio and TV, everybody mostly has that type of technology. But on the left hand side, I've got a picture there of a, visual, a virtual reality headset, um, which when I first started talking about VR, I would have put in the real innovators field. But we're now starting to see things like Google Cardboard, where schools are experimenting with visual reality, virtual reality, with cheap headset designs using phones. And that's starting to move up the curve. And we've got virtual reality on gaming platforms as well. So you can see that as they, as they progress, more and more people use this type of technology. But does that fit specifically for assistive technology? And DBAL did a study in uh, the US with college students looking at why they used or didn't use text to speech. And um, she came up with a very simple summary um, that I've put into a nice equation um, about how these students were affected um, to accept their technology. And she found that the more motivated and more need they had, the more likely they were to use the technology. But that was reduced if it took a lot of time for them to learn and use the technology, if there was a lot of effort involved or it caused them pain or discomfort. And also what she called stigma in that it made them feel um, there was some level of social anxiety around in, using the assistive technologies. For example, she quoted students who felt uncomfortable using headphones plugged into the computer while in computer labs because it felt like they were then identified as a disabled student. And this is all in the context of the user's environment as in where they're working, how they're working, how much control they have as well over the computers and systems that they can use. And what was important about that work was that element of stigma that is particularly associated with assistive technology. And obviously, when people are um, have dyslexia or other disabilities, we can't control their need. But what we can control is their motivation and the time, effort and stigma associated with using the technology. So the more that we increase the motivation um, to use the technology and the more we decrease the time, effort or social anxiety around using that technology, therefore, they're more likely to embed and use it in the longer term. So when talking about this, a lot of people say to me, is training the key? Do we need to make sure that everybody understands the assistive technology and is well aware of how to use it? Well, again, and I'm sorry for another graph, we know that the benefits related to learning new technology aren't always felt at the beginning of starting to use the technology. Again, I'm sure you can think back to your own experiences and think this isn't 
going to deliver what I thought it would. This isn't as easy for me to use. And the longer you use it, you start to experience the benefits. And the more complex the software or app or device, the longer it takes to learn. But one of the key successes of the iPad and the iPhone when they started 10 years ago or less was the whole out of the box experience, being able to just plug it in and it worked. And it's been shown again with these new devices, and particularly with websites and simple apps now, that the simpler it is to use, the shorter time it is to experience the benefits, the more people are likely to keep on using it. But when we think about training, we have to think about how people want to learn. And we have to think particularly now with people using technology as part of their learning, that they are used to looking things up on the internet, on Google, on Wikipedia. They're part of the YouTube generation where they're used to being shown videos to learn about anything and everything. And also they're starting to experience virtual realities, which allow you to actually have a hands-on experience of using um, a technology before you actually got it. So even if training is the key, maybe we need to think about how we deliver it and how we embed strategies. And if we put that into the context of what we know about metacognition and thinking about how we think to learn, we need to make sure that we're taking into account people's feelings and attitudes and beliefs to improve their motivation, which can then help us develop strategies, which again will improve their feelings and attitudes towards integrating the technology into their, into their lives. So the important thing here is that we're not ever talking about actually what the technology does and how we're going to use it. We're going to look at the strategies of how to embed the technology um, in our daily lives. So looking at technology strategies, where can you get some help? So we have an ongoing project at the University of Southampton called Lexdis.org and on there we put little um, vignettes and, and summaries and quotes of how to use various technologies, not necessarily specialist, uh, within learning. And it's great for you to go and look at, but also if you have any strategies or ways to use it, then please do get in touch with the email and we'll post it and add it for anybody to be shared. And this was originally started as a project in collaboration with students where we designed the platform and asked them what they needed to know. And one of the things we learned from that was also about the impact that technology can have on students' day-to-day -day lives. And I've put a quote up on the screen, and though it's not a positive quote, I always, again, like to reinforce that, you know, we need to understand the, the downsides of using technology and the impact in order to make sure it's effective. And this was a student at university who had been given assistive technology for the first time at university. And she said, I did feel like I was doing two courses at the same time, and that was frankly too much. And I had to stay with my old bad habits because I just didn't have the time to take out to learn something new, in this case, technology. It was a vicious circle, really. And I'm sure those of you that work with students can reflect on that and think back to scenarios where you've tried to, to give them a new strategy, a new way of doing something, but then it's failed because they haven't had time. And one of the issues we have is often we're introducing technology at the stage where things are already starting to go wrong, not preparing people earlier on in life, whether early in their education or um, before they get to the workplace, to make sure that they have the strategies and understand that technology can be key for them. So what about actually identifying which technologies are suitable? And um, some work with my colleague E.A. Draffen, who's also part of the BDA New Technologies Committee, uh, we came up with a model for selecting and evaluating technologies that looked at six factors. These six factors um, are movable, you can do them in any order, and they help you identify what tools can can be useful if you're thinking about embedding them um, as an assistive technology or in a learning environment. And in this, it starts with, if you want to, we call it STREET because of the, as an acronym, we start with the strengths. So we look at what can individuals do or what can the group of users potentially do. Then we look at the tasks we want them to complete. We look at the resources available and resources, always a critical question. People say there isn't enough money. I don't have enough computers. So often it's about are we looking for free solutions? Are we looking at the, the age of the computers that are available? Then we look at expertise and people often think expertise is about how um, 
how experienced the person who's going to use the technology is. But often the critical factor in the success of using technology is more to do with the technical knowledge around them. Do they have a technical support team that can help with difficulties? Is there somebody who understands the technology who can help them when they have questions? And that expertise can be a critical factor in deciding if you want to use a complex piece of assistive technology or something quite simple. Then the environment has a really big effect. Sometimes you want a piece of technology that people can take home, use on their phone or their tablet, and sometimes you want to put it across the network and make sure that everybody can use it all at the same time. So to give you an example of how that model works, I'm going to talk through the scenario of if I was in a school and I wanted to use text-to-speech, and particularly if I wanted to use text-to-speech both in the classroom and in the exams. So I've already decided what tool I wanted to use, and um, I know that I want to use it in the classroom and exams, so I might want to put it on a network. I know that my students can type and use a mouse, that's the strengths. I'm not looking for some way of the computer being controlled without using the being able to type or being able to see. And I want to help them with reading and proofreading. So those are the things I know that I, I can control. But the questions that remain are whether um, the expertise I have in my organisation, in my school, and there I would be needing to think about are the staff confident with technology? Is technical support available? And that would also lead me to questions about the resources. Do I want individual licences or network? Do I want a free or paid solution? If I had lots of technical support, then I may be uh, more comfortable going for a free solution where I know I have people who can help me fix it, such as a free open source tool. But if I don't have technical support and I do have the resources for a commercial license, I may be looking at something where I know I can phone somebody up if there's any problem. So hopefully that model is something that you can take away and think about when you, people are asking you, what technology should I use? What should we be thinking about putting in place in our organisation? So actually, I'm now going to start talking about some technology. You're probably thinking I've been here for half an hour and actually am I going to see any technology? And to be honest, not much. But I'm talking now about the types of tools that we do use for helping people with dyslexia. And the first critical one, the one where there's been lots of studies and lots of uses, text to speech. And that's when the computer reads back or e-reading may be talked about as well. Speech recognition is when we're talking to the computer and dictating text. And speech recognition has now become very um, prevalent. It's now in, in mobile phones and we're using it within our daily lives to control um, our speakers and phones all over the place. Then one of the key tools I include is word processing and proofing tools. Now that could be just a spell checker generally, but it could also be something like an automatic autocorrect tool uh, where you, um, the tool, the software is automatically identifying quite complex misspellings and correcting those. It could be recording and capturing, particularly is as people move up into higher education, they may have to take a lot of notes or if they're in the workplace where they have to attend meetings, recording and capturing information can be particularly difficult for people with dyslexia. It could be planning and organising tools and often we refer to mind mapping tools to help with um, organisational and writing, but also general um, idea gathering and revision tools. And then finally, reminders and organisations are a key way of using technology to help people who find it difficult um, with working memory difficulties and with organisation as well. So those are the types of tools that people are generally using for dyslexia. And there's many, much information on the website and the BDA New Technology site has information about many of these fields and apps. But I wanted to focus in the real big change over the last few years, which is built-in enabling technologies. And on screen is um, a link to our dyslexia awareness page on the BDA technology site, where we have some articles that we've written over the last few months and years about built-in enabling technologies. And in preparation for this, uh, this webinar, I went through all the major operating systems and actually did a pretty good, a pretty simple summary of where we're at with those major types of technologies with all the operating systems that are available. 
and um, we now have five different operating systems being used within our schools within our homes and in our workplace and what I was really surprised to find is how much of it is now built in so for example on Windows and particularly if you have an Office 365 license which most schools and colleges do there is text-to-speech there is speech recognition and there's spell checker and dictionary now built into the Office suite all of that is also on the Mac operating system on Android and on iOS that's for iPhones and iPads as well the caveat with Chrome iOS and Android is accessing some of those tools may require um, an internet ex um, internet connection at times and some functionality is more limited than others on the Chromebooks or in the Chrome browser, many assistive technologies are available through free um, extensions, some of which can then be in premium mode to offer you things like scanning as well. But essentially, pretty much everything that most students use with um, assistive technologies can be introduced through what is already built into all the computers we have in our homes, we have in our schools, and we have in our workplace. So actually using this assist, assistive technologies and enabling technologies isn't now about actually sourcing new technologies. It's about finding out what we have already and using it in the right way. Now, I'm going to try and do some technology whiz now. now I'm going to show a video. Um, on the screen and now uh, because of the way webinars work playing audio from a computer isn't the easiest thing um, so I'm just going to explain that I'm going to show you uh, Office 365 with an example of how the proofing tools have been developed to support people with dyslexia and with the text-to-speech tool that's now available within um, Word 365 through the read aloud button when the text is highlighted on the screen it is being read aloud i will try to get the sound to come through initially so you can hear what the computer sounds like um, but um, hopefully you can imagine the rest of the sound so here we go OK, it doesn't sound like the sound is going to come through, but hopefully you can see that now within here I can have my spell checking. I can have my spell suggestions read aloud. I can see synonyms, alternative words to help me understand what the words mean when I'm selecting from a spell checker. Normal spell checkers on their own seem like a good tool for helping people with dyslexia, but if they can't tell which is the right word in the suggestion list then it can be particularly difficult now word does um, have a grammar checker which they are trying to improve you can see here now we have some words underlined in blue some words um, underlined in red red is the spelling errors um, but the blue underlined words are those which it feels are um, potential errors as well so it is able to capture some homophones such as board and two but you'll see on the screen that it hasn't catched all of them in there and things like in uh, which was just on the screen hopefully it'll come back at the end of the door of the in isn't correct and isn't identified as correct the error in some sentences like C form the door that would be heard by the text to speech but it wouldn't be identified as a spelling error so you can see there that uh, running through that simple video that you can use these tools to correct many of the proofing areas that are quite common with people with dyslexia and that is all built in to office 365 okay so why isn't everyone using text-to-speech and similar tools in the classroom? Um, and I want to talk about some work that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, one of the areas I particularly work in with the BDA and, and with colleagues um, at the University of Manchester in Southampton is the use of assistive technology in exams, uh, particularly high-stake exams such as GCSEs. And in uh, the UK, you can use uh, text-to-speech in our English GCSE exam at age 16. 
but currently it's only being used by about 20% of the students that have access to reading support in other exams and in the GCSE English you're not allowed to have a person read aloud because it's assessing reading and this research is still ongoing but this is the type of thing we hear when we ask schools and teachers why aren't they using the technology it costs too much it's not reliable my pupils can't type fast enough I don't know how to use it my pupils don't like it teachers use books and worksheets. Now what's important to reflect on with those types of comments is this is all things that are related to their organisation, not necessarily to do with the technology itself and how it works. They say their pupils don't like it, but that's their impression often of the technology. And these are the types of things that often we are talked about, but when we talk through these issues, we find that they don't know that there are free or low cost solutions available. While there are commercial tools, they are often tied in with better technical support, and that is seen as an advantage, a return on investment as such, when you're paying for it. But often they see this as a cost to them in terms of the software. They say that um, it, they don't know how to use the technology, but often again, training is important for everybody, both staff and pupils. And we find that actually, if the teaching assistants and the admin staff aren't familiar with the technology, that can be the biggest barrier in how it is being used. As we've discussed so far, not everybody likes technology. But in the schools, you can often find your technology champions and often they are the pupils themselves. And by allowing those technology champions to talk about the potential benefits, you can improve people's motivation and, and make sure that technology is adapted. And then finally, particularly to do with the question to do with free worksheets and books, there are many free scanning apps available where you can take a picture of a, of a sheet in a, a worksheet or a page in a textbook and it will convert it to text and read it aloud. And there's a wonderful free service from RNIB called Bookshare, which any schools or colleges in the UK can sign up to and they can request digital versions of books for their pupils with dyslexia and other disabilities. So these questions Questions can often be talked through and understood and unpacked, but what is really at the core of this is low awareness of actually the benefits for assistive technology. So I wanted to talk to you about a really, really recent study. This has actually just come out in the last few weeks, which is a study in uh, Scandinavia, which looks specifically at the impact and training of assistive technology apps for dyslexic learners. And in this study, they provided both primary and secondary pupils with uh, tablets which had text to speech and speech recognition on them. And on the screen, I've, sh I've shown the graph, one of the graphs from their results and a summary of the results. And they found that 80% of primary school children and 57% of secondary pupils felt that text to speech, TTS, assisted their reading skills. And the graph there is actually the perceptions from the teachers. And you can see there with the light grey being primary school teachers and the dark grey being secondary teachers, that nearly all the teachers felt that it, it's using the AT on a tablet enhance the learning opportunities for their students with reading difficulties. It enhanced their reading development, their text comprehension and even their ability to write text. And they also felt uh, nearly 80% of secondary schools and over 80% of primary school teachers that it also assisted their own educational practice. But what was identified within this study is that extensive training and support was required. And that was also for the teachers themselves as well as for the pupils. And that some students still struggle to use the apps. And what they found after the project was 70% of, of the pupils continue to use the AT after the project. And if we go back and we look at all the studies that have been done with assistive technology, and we even think back to that lovely bell chart graph, we know that about 20 to 30% of people don't like technology and won't use it. So what this is showing is that we can have quite a big impact on uh, people's learning to do with reading and writing when we effectively use these assistive technologies if they're put in place with support and training but there will be some who will always struggle to use it 
So where do we go from here? The topic for the Dyslexia Awareness Week is 21st Century Dyslexia. So I wanted to look at new horizons for 21st century technology. So far, I haven't introduced any technology that's new. I've said it's all there. You've all got it in your pockets. But what is coming around the corner? Well, nice bright screen there. In our top right hand corner, we've got a word cloud and these are all the words that are buzzing around the technology industry and the computer science field. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, big data, smart devices, cloud computing, Internet of Things. What do these all mean actually for helping our students and individuals with dyslexia? So I want to put that into the context of the devices that we see and we are starting to use. And I've got a, an icon there with a hand and lots of devices. And that's about the Internet of Things and connected devices. All our home goods, our cars, our pocket devices are all becoming connected to the Internet and sharing information. What that could potentially help all of us to do is with organization and with personalization. And we're starting to see with um, the standards that web developers and software users, software developers are now using, are thinking about how can they personalize devices to meet the needs of all individuals, including those with dyslexia and disabilities. So we may start to know automatically when somebody opens um, a gets into their car and looks at the screen that the text will change the size that suits them and the font that suits that suits them this is where internet of things could really help those with barriers in the bottom right hand corner we have a an amazon echo device which has got a screen as well as being speech enabled and we've also got google home devices and these are really uh, demonstrating the power of being able to interface through speech in our homes but likewise this is is essentially speech recognition that we have on our phones and our computers as well. So I can ask my Amazon device uh, that I can't name because I'm sitting near, if it will read a book to me, I can ask it to spell a word, I can ask it to send a message, I can ask it to look up a definition or translate something for me. Those are all tasks that in the past I would have to have relied on reading text or writing text, which can be difficult when you can't spell the words. On the bottom left hand side there, we have a wearable device, an, an Apple Watch. Again, wearable technology, great for reminders and organizations. We get notified all the time. We get um, to all the advice that we need. It will tell us when to leave the house in order to read and reach an appointment. It will remind us of our tasks and our homework. And in the top left hand corner, virtual reality. I've mentioned that a few times, but that could have a really big impact on learning for people who struggle to understand text and, and work through a text based environment. It allows people to actually learn through doing, not through text. And these systems are becoming inc increasingly cost um, effective and um, ubiquitous and there's a lot of research and development going into using virtual reality within work-based learning and vocational learning in particular. So there's a wonderful range of technology just on the cusp of coming through. Some of it we already know is in consumer devices such as wearables, some of it will be coming into our education sphere very soon but hopefully you can see how assistive technology with its use of text-to-speech and speech recognition is really at the core of the technology that is becoming ubiquitous for everybody in their life. So finally, to end up, I wanted to leave you with a message that enabling technology in the 21st century is no longer about what the technology can do. It's about what we are trying to do and where and when we want to use it. And one final thought before we go to questions. What should you be doing now? First of all, keep it simple. If you want to use technology, make sure you're supplementing current strategies. Don't force change and use what's already in your pocket, even if it's just to experiment and try it out. If you're interested in using speech recognition with a child in a school, get them to talk to Siri or Google Voice on your computer to see if they like that experience. If you want to get them to use text to speech, why not start them off with a simple audio book? Highlight the benefits, 
focus on motivation and accept that not everyone will want to use technology. And that's in teaching staff as well. If we accept that not everybody has to understand how it works and what it will do, and that it's not always useful for everyone, it will be more successful for everyone. And work together. Think about pupil-teacher partnerships for training and user tr and trainer partnerships for those in the workplace. We can learn from each other and we can develop good strategies. And finally, that if you're in a school or a college or an employer, look at a whole organisation approach because actually this technology can, can help such a large range of people, not just people who consider themselves dyslexic, dyslexic, but actually by embedding enabling technologies for all, we can help improve productivity and enjoyment for everyone. So I'm going to stop there. Um, hopefully that's given you some food for thought. Um, on the screen is my email address and also my Twitter handle. So if you do want questions, have questions outside, I'm very happy to always try and answer them at some point or point you to people who may be better qualified than myself. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And I think I'm going to pass over to Donna, who's going to start reading out some questions. Abby, thank you so much. That was really, really useful and insightful. And as we both thought, we've got lots of questions. So let's try and get through as many as we can. We start with quite a basic one. It's from Miles and he's just asking, where can we find out more then about the technologies you've been talking about tonight, Abby? So as I mentioned, a really good place to start is the BDA Tech website, which is bdatech.org. There we try and give um, some background to the technology based on our own experiences um, through the committee members. So we're all either active in the assistive technology field, using assistive technology or teachers, or which has been reported to us through case studies, through examples. So that's always a good, really, a good place to start. There are also lots of forums and Facebook pages for um, with technology that people will try and help you out with. But then it really depends on what area you are in. Um, if you're in employment, there's um, if you're an employer, there's the Business Disability Forum. If you're in FE and HE, there's an organisation called JISC. And if in schools, unfortunately, at the moment in England and Wales, we don't have an organisation that helps with assistive technology. But as I said, the BDA tech members will try and help as best we can. Great stuff. OK, then we've got um, hopefully a pretty straightforward question from Lisa. Laptop or iPad for primary pupils? I would say that um, iPads are really good learning environment tools and they're really good for helping um, motivate children and for engaging children. But laptops become more useful if you're starting to think about um, replacing handwriting and text. Um, it's difficult to type on an iPad unless you have an external keyboard for any length of time. Um, and from a, from a reading and writing point of view, um, a laptop becomes more appropriate. But saying that iPads are very good and easy to use in the, in the classroom. So it's about really what you want to do with the device more than the age range. Great. And I think that might tie in with Sarah's question, Abby. She asks, do you think a Kindle is beneficial for younger children? So another tablet question. So Kindles are, are um, there's two types of Kindles. There's the Kindle dedicated ebook device and there's the Kindle Fire, which is essentially a, an Android tablet equivalent to the iPad. Ebook devices like Kindles are particularly useful for people who like to change the fonts font size, font spacing, who find that very easy to adapt um, on those devices. But most of the Kindle dedicated devices don't have any audio, so you can't read aloud text to speech. A Kindle Fire or any tablet has audio built into it, so then you can start to use audio books or apps which have combination of audio and text um, or um, a, a book which is then being read aloud by the device. So it if you want audio, it's better to go for a tablet type device, but use the Kindle app on those. Great stuff. Thanks, Abby. Now, we're getting quite a lot of quite technical questions about technology, and I, I will read some of them out. But am I right thinking, Abby, if we recommend that people send some of their questions through to BDA conference address, we can share with the technology committee rather than 
going through some very detailed questions this evening. Absolutely, and I'm happy that um, we can create a summary of them as well. We'll try and share share answers so that people can, can refer back to them as well. Great stuff, thank you. But we will have a go at this one, and this is from Teresa. Can you recommend any touch typing programs for key stage two pupils? I frequently recommend assistive technology for my dyslexic pupils, but slow typing skills can be limiting factor to getting them started. Absolutely, typing is a really important skill and that's something that's critical and, and I always say when talking to parents and teachers of late key stage two, early key stage three, that getting good typing skills is critical. Um, we don't like to particularly recommend products specifically, um, but ones that I know are very useful that use real word um, typing is uh, there's the Nessie, Nessie key, sorry, Nessie fingers it's called, which um, is based around uh, study strategies as well. For those who uh, want a bit older, there's a typing program called CAS, um, which is just sentences and very useful. And there's another one called English Type, which was um, developed specifically by an educational psychologist. So again, is based around reinforcing spellings um, all the time. So those are particularly good ones. Thanks, Abby. Um, question from Anna. Do you have any technology aid suggestions for dyscalculia? You spoke a lot about dyslexia this evening. Anything with number? Any suggestions? So dyscalculia is an interesting one um, because there isn't much technology and there isn't really much work yet about how technology can help people with dyslexia. But using things like grids to make sure that number pl are placed in uh, a sensible order and they don't lose track of numbers is useful. Um, I've worked with um, older students sort of secondary level upwards about using typing and um, a program called OneNote to capture their notes in on the computer instead of handwriting where they're confusing numbers and missing numbers and getting confused. So actually getting people to capture information on, on the computer um, can then reduce the risk of mistakes being made. Um, in terms of um, helping with dyscalculia, we are starting to see text-to-speech for maths come through. So you can have some maths read aloud in Microsoft Word and on web pages that again be shown that actually that can help by reinforcing um, what they're hearing and saying. Um, I going to say I will probably also ask Donna to, to ask me that question and we'll make a note of it to give some specific links to some maths programs because I can't recall their names off the top of my head. Yes, no problem whatsoever, Abby. And again, just to tell everybody, I'm very aware because I'm looking at the question box, there's lots and lots of fantastic questions. So if we don't answer them all tonight, it's very likely we won't. Um, please do uh, paraphrase them, send them through to me in the conference email address and we will share with Abby and we'll put together kind of frequently asked questions. The other comment just to make to everybody, we will be sharing the recording of this session, so please don't worry, we know that there's been a lot of good information that we don't want to lose, so we will share as well. Uh, next question, um, Abby, is from Alison, and she's talking about, I think, commenting on what you said this evening about sometimes a resistance in schools when you're trying to convince schools to use more technology and she's saying is there any research that she can use to present to school to her colleagues to encourage the use of assistive technology more widely? So hopefully there's been some studies and reports that I've mentioned in today's slides that you can access about the impact of assistive of technology. Um, then it's particularly about looking at the, um, the, the sort of scenario of the school itself. And there is an organisation up in Scotland called Call Scotland, that's C-A-L-L, -L. so if you search for Call Scotland, and they're part of the University of Edinburgh and they provide assistive technology advice in Scotland and they have really good case studies and examples of how technology is being used in a wide range of schools. Um, for more complex needs, there's an organisation called ACE Centre that provides um, case studies as well on communication devices. 
Um, and if you're looking in the FE sector, then as I mentioned, GIS, G, JISC have um, some really good case studies and examples. But again, we'll, we'll put this up into an FAQ so you have some links to go to. Brilliant. Thanks, Abby. And I think maybe we've got time just for one more question. It could be a very uh, salient point. Mark is saying, is the price of technology a key factor when people are, are thinking about using technology or organisations? Do, do we think, Abby, in the future, you spoke about the future, are we going to see a, a price reduction in some of these um, technological whizzes and, and revolutions that are potentially coming along? I think it's perceived cost and unfortunately that's partially because we are reliant on um, commercial companies um, developing these new technologies and, and exploring and innovating and, and I've worked in the commercial sector and I, I know how, how critical that is that um, often these specialist tools are built you know on a one-to-one -one basis to begin with um, but it's a perceived issue and often it's about saying within the organization no there are low cost um, alternatives we, we don't have to invest huge amounts in the technology but often you have to balance that against the cost somewhere else so for example you know it, it may be more technical to install um, I might not be able to put it on my network as easily um, for text to speech you may not have a huge range of voices that might need to be paid for as an extra addition but there are a huge range of free technologies available um, pretty much everything as I've shown today is a built into all our devices so you can start using it out of the box the cost is more in time of time training and getting it embedded within your organization brilliant thanks Abby okay so um the clock has beaten us and it just leaves me to say a huge thank you to all our listeners again I'll just repeat please do send any questions on and Abby and the team at the technologies committee will work on them and we will share them back with everyone and we will be sharing this recording as well Abby thank you so much that was so informative as always thank you Donna and we just wish everybody a happy rest of the week in terms of Dyslexia Awareness Week. And remind everyone, I think it's very appropriate, tomorrow is No Pens Day. And it couldn't come at a better time after this evening's webinar, I think. So we just say good night to everyone and wish them a great rest of the evening. Good night. Thank you very much for listening.